Hello and, and good evening and welcome to this uh, special event tonight. It's Imperial College London's Global Development Hub Annual Lecture for 2022. My name is Michael Templeton. I'm a Professor of Public Health Engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial. Uh, and I'm also the Oxfam and Water for People Royal Academy of Engineering Research Chair in Global Sanitation Technology. Um, I'm here tonight in my role as co-chair of Imperial's Global Development Hub, uh, which I co-chair with Professor Sarah Fiddler, who's in the front row here from our Faculty of Medicine. She's a professor of HIV and communicable diseases, and you'll be hearing from her a bit later on this evening. So for those who don't know about the Global Development Hub, it's, it's an ambitious uh, initiative focused on leveraging research and education expertise in science, technology, medicine, and business to impact on sustainable development challenges that are faced by the most vulnerable and marginalized people in societies where multiple global challenges are acutely concentrated. So it's a London-based platform, but our ethos is very much focused on co-leading and co-creating interventions with our global network of alumni, academic and non-academic partners and collaborators across 192 countries in total. So if you'd like to find out more, please do check out our webpage and, and get involved. I have a few sort of housekeeping things to go over. So first of all, welcome to our online participants also. And I'd encourage the online participants to put questions in the chat, which we're monitoring uh, this evening and we'll get to later on. Um, also to let everyone know that the event is being recorded this evening. Um, please put your mobile phones on silent if you haven't already. Um, and if there is a fire alarm, it's the real deal. So please uh, go out through uh, one of the exits there and the assembly point is the corner of Exhibition Road and Imperial College Road. So that's the boring housekeeping things. Uh, so now it's, it's my pleasure to hand over to our chair and host for tonight, who is Professor David Nabarro, who is going to introduce our annual lecture and our esteemed guest of honor this evening. So first of all, a few words about David. Uh, David is the World Health Organization's special envoy on COVID-19. He's also the co-lead of the UN Global Crisis Response Group, and he's the co-director of the Institute of Global Health Innovation here at Imperial. In October 2018, David received the World Food Prize, together with Lawrence Haddad, for their leadership in raising the profile and building coalitions for action for better nutri nutrition across the Sustainable Development Goal efforts. He's also curated the Food Systems Dialogues, which is a contribution to the transformation of food systems, bringing together leaders and experts from across the world. So we're really lucky to have David here with us also this evening, and he's been a huge supporter of the Global Development Hub. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Lovely. Well, it's so, it's so wonderful to see a really full lecture theater tonight. I know we're competing with some interesting stuff, uh, going on in uh, Qatar, but uh, you're here, and that's what really matters, and thank you for coming. And thank you for coming because tonight you're going to meet and hear from, for me, one of the most extraordinary global leaders on food systems and their future. And uh, there are many things I could say about our chief guest, Dr. Agnes Calabata, but I've chosen six, and I'll say them quickly, but uh, I hope they will have uh, some use for you as you place Dr. Calabata in your own thinking and understand just what her contribution is. For 35 years, this Rwandan-born lady was actually a refugee in Uganda. Uh, she was born to small-scale farmers, what we call smallholders, and she managed, despite the fact that she was a refugee, to actually, during those 35 years, proceed through to both uh, graduate degrees and master's degrees from Makerere University in Uganda, in Uganda. And then she went on to the University of Massachusetts and completed a PhD in entomology uh, in 2005. Then in 2008, after some research work, she became Rwanda's Minister for Agriculture. That's my third fact about Agnes. And while she was Minister for Agriculture, Rwanda's agriculture budget increased enormously, Rwanda's poverty rate dropped massively, and Rwanda became the lead country for transformation of its agriculture system. She's particularly remembered for
for the one cow per household program, which was key not only in reducing poverty, but also improving nutrition of Rwanda's uh, young children. Then in 2014, really after she was Minister for Agriculture, she became president of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. This is an organization that works to help smallholders increase their income. And during her time as president, uh, Agra has had some pretty incredible achievements. We might get Agnes talking about those this evening. Then, as if that wasn't pretty amazing, uh, in 2020, she served as the United Nations Secretary General's special envoy for the first ever food systems summit that the UN has held. Actually, the appointment was in September 2019, but uh, Agnes worked through 2020 and then into 2021 till the end of that year, leading a process for work on that summit that enabled us and my team to support it with widespread food systems dialogues. It was the most inclusive and participatory exercise that I believe the United Nations has ever undertaken in the agriculture and food space. A huge welcome to people sitting here who have been also involved in that process. So I'd love to name, but that wouldn't be appropriate right now. And then in uh, November this year, just two days ago, she went to see Prince Albert in Monaco where she received one of his very, very scarce awards uh, for planetary health, the Prince Albert Planetary Health Awards for her work in contributing to sustainable agriculture and food systems. As we were coming and I said, what's next? And uh, Dr. Calabata said to me, I just want to work for the future of people in Africa and their food systems. We're going to hear about that now. Thank you for coming tonight. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Agnes Calabata to give her lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Is my voice loud enough? Yeah. Good. Very good. I almost thought you were talking about someone else, David. Yeah. So, but uh, I'm really, really glad that, uh, David, you had me invited here, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, conversation tonight. Um, it's true, I grew up in Uganda, but it's not everybody that grows up in a country gets to have the opportunities I had to be able to go to university, do a PhD, and all that. So I always look at myself as that village girl somewhere, just like any other village girl could have grown up in a rural area, and I'll talk about that later. But I just want to put things in context, David. Yes, uh, we were refugees, but also we got the opportunity to be able to get the education that we needed, and we're extremely grateful to that. Now, first forward, the food systems conversation is the science conversation like we, is indicated here. It has a political imperative that we must discuss but it's also an investment opportunity. So what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the challenges that the food system faces that, we, that actually led to the Food System Summit, uh, the 2021 Food System Summit. Many people want to, or like to call the food system broken. I, I never look at it that way. It still food feeds us, so it's not that broken. But it is broken in a sense because we have so many millions of people, billions of people that are outside the food system that are not getting enough food. We have millions of children that still go undernourished in, in a world of plenty. You would know that since we figured out the Green Revolution thing, we are producing five times as much food as we, we used to produce. And a lot of it we don't need uh, to, to be having in this world. A lot of it goes to waste, actually. Three, one trillion dollars worth of food. We have a lot of people that have deteriorated diseases. And of course, we are contributing to climate change. So it, for those reasons, uh, people have actually decided, a number of people decide, decided to refer to our food system as broken. 
or refer to our food system as broken a number of times. But so this lady was recognized, as you would know, for the work she has done to demonstrate that actually food systems and what is happening in our food system is part of the challenges we need to address if we are going to really address the question of climate change. So with all that background, the Secretary General decided in 2019 to launch the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Two things were in his mind, two very important things. That we have a global conversation on food systems. That we do have an agreement of, around what's broken and what needs to be fixed. That was his primary goal. The second one was that we engage people. And engage people we did. That's why David, as he was saying earlier, led a global dialogue involving all nations of the world so that we could have commitment at country level that is led by governments themselves. This is very critical when it comes to member states and how they think and how they work. Engaging member states in those conversations was very important. But we also did have other dialogues. We had thousands of people engaged in what we called independent dialogues because we realized that there was no trust in our food system. And the more you provided space for people to dialogue, civil society, private sector, governments to dialogue, it was as important as, 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 the, as the, the public sector dialogues we were having with the governments. We created spaces for young people. We created spaces for indigenous people. We created spaces to ensure that everybody felt that they, had, they were being heard. <clears throat> so, the whole point behind this whole conversation was to demonstrate that there's no way we are going to achieve SDGs if we don't fix the change of food systems. Because like I said earlier, they are part of the problem. But they are also part of the biggest opportunity in front of us. The food system represents 37%. If we manage to reduce emissions by, in food systems, we would contribute 37% towards the net zero which is a huge opportunity. So it's not like we are lame ducks in this from a food system perspective. We are actually part of the problem, and we are actually part of the solution as well. A number of areas have emerged since. Uh, people talk about regenerative agriculture and what it can contribute. In Africa, we've done regenerative agriculture forever. There are reasons why it didn't advance the way it did. Are there new ways of thinking about regenerative agriculture that we can think about? that can make this the biggest way of producing food in the future. One thing is for a fact, we must use that opportunity to build soil carbon. Uh, at least in Africa, we have a big challenge of soil carbon. Maybe the answer sits within regenerative agriculture. I don't know, but that's an area that we must, we must focus on. With climate change and all these things, can Africa actually feed itself? There are studies that have been done, and clearly, if Africa focused on improved seeds and getting improved seeds to farmers, the right level of nutrition and judicious nutrition, <coughs> Africa could feed itself. But we would have to get those seeds in the hands of farmers and those fertilizers in the hands of farmers. So we'll see a bit of that tonight. Now, going to each of those, and fast forward, the Food System Summit was a huge success, if you ask me. It was a huge success because we reached one 193 countries of 196. Of those, 163 actually showed up for the summit. Of those, 77 were actually heads of state. Meaning that level of commitment in a period of about 24 months is something you don't see all the time. Each of those came with what we call um, a pathway led by David. Those pathways are commitments that we are now turning into strategies that can be implemented. That's very, very critical. We'll come back to that in a second. We did see initiatives around different groups of people coming together around things they care about. Loss and damage, for example, or a reduction of, of food loss. I just mentioned how food loss is a $1 trillion industry now, contributing 8% to, uh, to emissions. There's a coalition around that. We have over 30 of those. We created a commitment register where anybody could commit. We had 231 commitments at the time of the Food System Summit. The most known are the commitments from the US government, 10 billion at that point in time. 
to, to deal with the challenges of the food system, commitments from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to deal with the challenge of malnutrition in the food system, and several others um, have been made. There was a scientific group. We had 25 scientists from 25 different institutions contributing to the Science of the Food System Summit, which has resulted into the Science Reader. It's being published now. You'll have access to it, but it's also available on the web. And then there was the Secretary General's statement that talks about how we go forward from here. But more importantly, there was elevation of public discourse. This conversation is happening now. This conversation is happening everywhere. And this conversation is something that's not, we are not going back to. Understanding that we are actually in the food system, we are actually part of the problem to climate change. And that we need to fix that is part of the solution that we can bring to the world. So yes, it's impacting us in a, a terrible way. If you live on the equator like I do in Kenya, they haven't seen one decent season for the last five years. So it's no wonder that Kenya has the type of drought that it has this year, because they actually haven't. Does it rain? Yes. But it's off calendar. It's not enough. And if there's one thing you get to understand from a farmer, growing up on a farm like I did, we actually know the day the rains start. We actually know the day the rains end. A farmer would tell you that. That's how they've survived in farming for thousands of years, millions of years. Until recently, until 40, about climate change started about 40 years ago, but really became a problem for me in 2013. I could tell you the exact date. When every farmer is calling in to ask what's happening, is the rains coming? Are they not coming? 2013, you know, for us on the equator. So very serious problem. But then the, that public conversation is, is currently going on. So this has led the whole conversation. I talked about public discourse. So in Africa, we took, on, we took the food system summit extremely seriously. 49 out of 55 countries engaged. These countries have food system pathways. And we have started, following on to the, the, the summit, we have started what we are calling, uh, working with uh, NEPAD and, and the African Union. We are supporting countries to design strategies and investment plans out of the, those, those food system pathways so that they get away from being political statements to actually things that countries can use and be able to deliver direct, direction. So I just want to quickly move on to what the opportunity that I talked about. You know, uh, WRI did a study a while ago, and I'm sure you can find this on the web. But here they are showing what we could do to reduce food systems uh, emissions and be part of the solution, the 37% I talked about. But this is talking about 2050. And I think since this study was done, we know that we don't have 2050. That was before the Russia-Ukraine crisis. That was even probably before COVID-19. Now, we really need to move faster than is projected here. Why? Because all these challenges have actually moved us closer to using more coal, to doing some of the things we had stopped doing, putting us in a position where it might even be more difficult to stay within 1.5. So um, the urgency, I, I think, from, from this uh, from all this crisis just shows that we need to be doubling down on what needs to be done to deal with climate change. Solutions exist. I mean, here, from coming from COP27, and maybe some of you participated in COP27, maybe here I just mentioned two things. We were extremely proud that the <coughs> Egyptian government hosted COP27. Egyptian government made it and talked about it as the African COP. What were we looking for? We're looking for loss and damage and the challenge of dealing with loss and damage. Yes, um, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa contributes 0.3% to emissions, but definitely is badly damaged by climate change. So the creation of a loss and damage fund is something that we welcome and we're extremely happy about. But again, the fund is a fund. Until it has resources, it will be a fund. So some of the things we talk about, though, and again, I'm not going to go into those African problems because you already know them, uh, but I'll talk about some of the solutions that we look at. We, look, we have started monitoring how things are going and trying to advise countries on how they can stay ahead of, 
of the problem, especially by monitoring food security, where, where can, how can we trade better? How can we prevent export bans from within ourselves? How can we increase intra-African trade? So uh, my institution this, does some of that to ensure that countries are actually staying on top of what is happening, have information around where food is, and we're actually in some cases able to intervene and help countries understand that creating export bans creates small problems for countries. But there are other solutions, right, um, to deal with the issue of climate change, and I'm going to skip this. Uh, some of that has already been done and modeled by Mackenzie here, and you can read these slides later. I'll pass them on so that you understand. I just want to show you some of the things we could do from an African perspective. This was trying to model what could happen if we tried to deal with the challenge ourselves as Africa. So it's one thing to talk about loss and damage and what the rest of the world owes Africa, but it's another thing for Africa to fix its problems as well, and that's what I want to talk about here. You see, Africa is already, from a maize perspective, which is a crop we eat a lot of, we're already there in terms of producing enough maize. But definitely the challenge that you have is distribution. Here in Europe, you, you are food secure, not because you produce food. You are food secure because food distribution works very well. So one of the things we need to figure out in Africa is how to distribute food as a way of dealing with food insecurity. So just to, sh that just to show you that if we were to invest in wheat, it would probably take another eight years and would be food secure. And why would it take that long? We need to generate seeds, we need to generate fertilizers, we need to find all those things, we need to create the systems. So food security and producing food is not a major problem in Africa. What is a problem is how we move food around. And we need to figure it out. I uh, think this is one of the least invested areas. There's a reason why um, you all have invested so much in, in the rail system. It works very well. The water system works very well. We probably don't have that opportunity from a water system in Africa, but we definitely can invest in other infrastructure and make food much more available. So Africa's food challenge is not so much about production as it is about movement of food. It, access to better producing varieties of food, that's what my institution does. We produce lots and lots of varieties of, of, of uh, improved varieties of the different commodities that Africa produces. So for us, um, wheat is important, yes. I don't even think that you see it here. Among the crops that my institution has funded or supported to ensure that we have the right varieties with good yields, uh, resistant disease, high yielding, but also drought tolerant. These are some, you can see that we do a whole range of things across the continent that puts the continent in a good place if these things were accessible to farmers and available in farmers' hands. But again, they face the same challenges as I talked about with, with regards to food. Another challenge that is being, uh, is, it's been a major problem for Africa, of course, especially with the Russia-Ukraine crisis, is fertilizers. You can see that over the last one year, fertilizers tripled in price. It's only now that they're beginning to come back down. I was um, moderating a heads of state session at, at COP27, and there were about 10 African governments, three of them were already talking about how to produce, how they are going to, com they were committing to producing fertilizers from hydrogen. <clears throat> so something that wouldn't have happened if they were not finding themselves in this type of, of, of situation. There are other things that we can think about that are becoming very important to all of us. Um, uh, it's driven by innovation food systems. I, I was telling someone earlier how a few weeks ago I was in Singapore. And just by creating the right policy environment around stem cell research, they're actually beginning to produce chicken, they're beginning to produce shrimps from stem cell research, right? And you know what that is about. Uh, I don't have to explain a whole lot about that, but that's, uh, that's innovation at work, really recognizing that we need to overcome the, the challenges that are being thrown us at us from a climate change perspective. I talked earlier about regenerative agriculture, and that's an area that we are looking at very closely in Africa, and really thinking through how these mixes of crops can help manage pests, but can also help manage, manage uh, uh, soil carbon and can help reduce the amount and the need of fertilizers, especially farmers. 
are using the right varieties. I'm not reading everything here, but I'm just trying to give you a sense. We're also looking at how to reduce um, the area that is being degraded as a result of, of cultivation. So in the lower photograph, you can see all oh, that whole area is being trunted by trees. But the reason farmers can do that is because now they have enough. Like you can see from the maize crop above and the, 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 the bean crop on the side, they can produce enough with less. So you can use less land with the right varieties, produce more, and give up the rest of the land for reforestation. This is something that's going to become very, very important as we go forward because 46% of Africa is actually, uh, African farmland is actually degrad degraded from, from agriculture and from low input use. Sometimes I've heard people talk about, no, we don't need to be using fertilizers, you don't need to be, um, we need to reduce fertilizer use. Sorry, I'm moving too fast. But you know what? In Africa, for a continent that is that degraded from millions of years of, of use for agricultural purposes, not using fertilizers is going to be much more degrading than using fertilizers. So when we talk about reducing fertilizer use, we need to ask ourselves where and why. So there are parts of the world where you, we are using like 300 kilograms per, per hectare to produce 10 metric tons. Let's say of maize, which maize you actually don't need? Right? A farmer to feed a family of five needs about half a ton, right? Even in Africa. So producing 10 metric tons because it's going to do something else that has nothing to do with feeding a family. For Africa, less than half a ton is not feeding you. So you need to produce a little bit more. So if we all met at about five metric tons, we could actually have a better world where Africa is able to produce five metric tons that feeds Africa and is able to get families out of poverty and reduce degradation of the environment. And for the rest of the world where 300 kgs are being used to produce 13 or 14 metric tons, we could actually reduce the, that back to five and still have a good world. So I guess here the issue is, can we find the right balance between what we are doing to feed ourselves how much we are losing. Can you believe that Europe loses as much food every year as Africa produces every year through um, waste? We don't need to do that. It's just the kind of luxuries we've built in our lives we don't, that we don't need to do. But we've, that time has come when we need to stop these things and ask ourselves whether that's actually what we need and whether we should be doing those type of things. So uh, I would like to, re I'm recognizing that my, my uh, time is up, David, and I want to give you a little bit of time. But I just needed to leave three things with you. There's, for us in Africa, we, look, we see an opportunity sustainable farming. Sustainable farming means what I just told you, <coughs> finding the right balance between feeding people and the environment. We have to, we cannot pit one against the other. We need the environment to live for our children and their children, but we need to feed people today. So how do you create that balance? Number one. Number two, we also need to recognize that we are interconnected. There's nothing you can do here in Europe from a climate change perspective that will not impact us in Africa and vice versa. So we really need to become each other's guardians in one way when it comes to climate and the environment. Number one. We need to take care of our soils. Uh, for us, it's even more important in Africa because like I said earlier, highly degraded. So any science you're generating in this institution here and other places that can help people deal with the challenge of soil carbon is going to be so important to feeding the world uh, in ways that we will only understand uh, in future. For Africa, Drought tolerant varieties today are going to probably be the number one solution to this problem because um, things are changing very fast and farmers that are able to have a crop stay out in the field for less are going to be able to do better than farmers that have crops live out there for very long as rains are very unpredictable. There's something called the true cost of food. This has been done, this has been analyzed. 
we are really paying a huge cost from an environmental perspective, I just told you, 30%. But let's also be realistic from a health perspective. We never ever think about how much we pay. You know, when I was working in Rwanda from a Minister of Agriculture perspective, we always look at health from a Minister of Health perspective. But what happened to feeding people right and making sure that we, we don't need to go to hospital if we don't need to? Malnutrition, why should you treat it in hospital? All that related diseases, why should they be treated in hospital? Why not on the farm where food comes from? So there's that cost that we don't think about. And yet that cost and the cost of the environment is two thirds of the amount of money we spend on food, which just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then people, we must stay within 1.5 degrees. Really, we need to stay within 1.5 degrees. I mean, all of us can be activists, all of us can be any sorts of things. I'm just trying to, I'm asking you. For us in Africa, there's no place for us. On the equator, there's no place for us in a world that is more than 1.5 degrees. Even now, we're struggling. But it's not going to stay in Africa alone. I mean, what happened this last summer is not something anybody had foreseen. We want to have a place, if Africa is, gets impacted the way it is, we want, we, we want you to be in a better place than us. But this looks like if we don't try to stay within 1.5 degrees, we, are in, we really are in, are in for trouble, all of us, not just Africa. But Africa gets impacted first because we are very close to the equator and other places We'll have more rain, we'll, ours will go away very quickly. Other places, rain will increase. But until when? You know, this problem is going, going to go on and go on and go, in, go on forever if we don't stop it in its track now. Climate change was first observed in, the, in 1922, or maybe even earlier, at least the, the records that I was told is that far. We only started noticing things seriously 40 years ago. Five years ago, things have gone completely, are uh, getting a little bit out of control. So I think if you want to advocate, like I do, please, let's stay within 1.5 degrees. That's the only message I would like to leave with you. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Thank you very much indeed, yeah. Agnes. Please take a seat here, or stand, stand if you want to stand. So. I, I mean, I just, I, you've said it to me before, but uh, I, you've said it just again today now, and I think it's important that we all take heed of this main message, that climate change is speeding up, and African farmers feel it acutely. There are a number of famines underway in the world, most of them are in either the Horn of Africa or in Sahel because, as Agnes has said, African people just feel it first and feel it worst. And some of the points that you made talk about things getting better by 2050, but the message that I've heard tonight, perhaps more precisely than I've heard it before, is we don't have time. We're in 2022, nearly 2023. That's uh, quite a long time, 27 years before 2050 comes along. But as far as I can tell, what you're saying is there'll be no agriculture left in much of Africa by 2050, and there'll be no livelihoods left. It's just really urgent. Am I right? <laughs> I guess that's what I was trying to say. Look, um, many of the things we, when we say 2050, again, we didn't see COVID-19 coming, yeah. which is part of what's going on in our landscape and in yeah. our environment. We didn't see the Russia-Ukraine crisis coming and worsening things. And, and the reason 2050 sounds like a stretch is, again, right now, it's really important 
or let me put it differently, right now, a number of countries are going back on their promise to yeah. stay within 1.5 degrees. Yeah. So 2050 was premised on the fact that we stay on track. Yeah. If we are getting off track, how can 2050 be? So that's, for me, the most important thing. Number one. Number two, some of the, the things that we are se seeing, the rate at which things are happening, yeah. was, is a surprise every day. It's yeah. not built into 2050. When people say, when you look at 2050, people tell you that oh, yields will decrease by 12%. Unless you don't live in Africa. In Africa, yields are decreasing by 100%. That's why people are hungry. In Africa, yields are decreasing by 50%. That's why people are hungry. So where is, what are you talking about 2050? It's not, there's no 2050. And yet, when I'm working with you, when I'm working with leaders in, in Africa, when we were together at the African Green Revolution Forum in Kigali in September, you still feel an enormous sense of optimism from presidents and prime ministers and farmers' leaders. What they're basically saying is, give us a chance and we can manage. But if you set the rules so that we in Africa are bound to fail, then we don't have a, ch we don't have a chance. And I want to stress this because the other thing that Agnes Kalabata just reminded us is that because of a number of factors, COVID, climate change, various conflicts around the world, things globally are getting very difficult. Development assistance is being cut back by most advanced nations. And even businesses are reducing their global investment. How can we actually counter that and just get the support that African farmers, African small enterprises need to be able to get over the present difficulty and move towards the sustainable food systems you describe. So, um, David, I think uh, the reason I keep emphasizing 2050 and what could happen and the whole thing of going back to 1.5 why it's important is, first of all, we need to stay within what is manageable by mankind. Yeah. Because once it gets out of control, we really don't know what, what's going to happen. So within that, there are a number of challenges that we need to deal with together as a community. And from a multilateral perspective, we've committed so many things. Um, right now, again, because of COVID-19, a number of African countries are struggling with debt, Yes, this is when you expect multilateralism to come through yeah. and support those countries that are, are struggling and be able to help them cope with the impact of having lost so much during COVID-19 and, and really catch up with the development they were trying to, to have. You know, the challenge, the really annoying thing about COVID, I mean about this whole situation, climate change, COVID-19, Russia, Ukraine crisis, is as a scientist from the work that I do, I feel like we're so close, yeah. so close because we now have all these varieties that are exactly what farmers are looking for. In the crops they grow, mm -hmm. having the right variety for cassava, having the right variety for yams, having the right variety for beans that iron fortified gives you for four and a half metric tons. These are the type of things as a scientist you want your farmer to have. These are the type of things my father didn't have access to as a farmer when I was growing up, but these are the things farmers in Africa could have access to today. But they won't be of value if there's climate change. That's because they, they can't have a crop. Now, when I talk about staying within 1.5 degrees, the reason it's important is we also, in the absence of aid, in the absence of any support from outside world, we too can fix some of these problems ourselves. We can plant trees, we can do whatever, we can, but we, it has to be humanly possible. It's not like Africa is handicapped or can't do anything by, for, for Africa, no. We can do certain things to get to recapture our environment, but that has to be within what's doable. We have no control over climate change. We are not contributing to climate change significantly. We need the world to stop moving climate change out of control because that's when we know what to do. So that's why I keep emphasizing yeah. that point. We, can, we are actually not helpless. We can do certain things, but it has to, to be within 
what's humanly possible. And that, everybody, that's what I learned from Agnes, that yes, African nations and African people have got the capacity to come through this, but not if the dial is set to super hot and everything becomes impossible. And that's the trajectory right now. And that's why these climate cops, as they're called, like the one in Sharm el Sheikh that's just happened, and the next one that's coming up, why they're so important, and why the failure of the emitting nations to reach agreement is not just an irritation if you are working for climate action, <coughs> but is actually creating an impossible situation for tens of millions of farmers throughout Africa. Thank you. Do you want to say the last word? No, and then no. We'll get I, questions from the audience. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm speaking to you as scientists, as professionals, but also as leaders of tomorrow. This is something we've got to fix people, right? We don't have two worlds. We don't have a backup plan. The plan is here and now today. And yes, we need you to really help, you know, um, lift your voices, get this work done, because again, the challenges of this world will not go away. It becomes a spiral. You know, one thing leads to another. But the biggest opportunities, we must fix climate change. Thank you very much indeed. That's my little bit finished. And I'd like Professor Sarah Fiddler to come here or wherever she wants to be because we've got some questions that have been submitted both from people who are with us and people online and also opportunities to continue the discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you so much, Agnes, for, for starting this off. So I've got my laptop here because I'm looking online and questions that have been posted already. So just to invite anybody online who would like to post a question, please go ahead. We are ready for your question. But if I may start, Agnes, with a question we had from Chantal Clement, who is the Deputy Director of IPES Food, who's talked about the current food price crisis. And that's affected all of us all over the world. And she says it's revealing that business as usual in food systems is not a viable solution for change, particularly in relation to rising energy costs, food insecurity, and the impoverishment of rural and farming communities. She'd like you to speak to the role of agroecology and other innovative things that are happening on the ground to transform our food systems. I guess um, one of the things you, get, you quickly learn about Africa is, um, and again, I'm going to talk about Africa here, is how, in a way, we kind of tend to defy some of the, the biggest myths that come with some of these challenges. COVID-19 was a huge challenge. We were all worried Africa is going to really collapse with this, given the lack of this and that. Same thing, Russia, Ukraine. But you know, it, if it wasn't for the fact that there were ways of doing business that are probably anchored in agroecology in Africa, you know, uh, where commodities we've always grown, crops we've always used really are, are working on Africa and working for people. Maybe it would have been a major challenge, right? So, so the fact that uh, you have wheat as, as one of the commodities that is, really got out of, of control in terms of prices, but it's not a major problem for African countries where, this where diversification of commodities was... Uh, was came in and, 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 and assured that, uh, that communities were able to survive. So there's a place for agroecology. There's a place for doing the right thing in the right place, right? And there's a place for trying to understand what should we do where. In fact, uh, in Rwanda, the easiest place I can, the easiest thing I can think of, one of the successes of Rwanda was trying to, making sure that we do uh, in areas what worked very well and what worked in best in those areas. We didn't try to force stuff. Mm. So if there's an area that produces cassava, we doubled down on that and ensured that those farmers do well what they do. So I think there's an opportunity to start building on those, that level of diversification and that level of understanding ecologies and really 
facilitating and, and supporting ecologies for what they can do rather than uh, try to push uh, environmental <coughs> limits. Thank you, Agnes. So one of the questions online has come to say that one of the most important things they feel we need, and they'd like your opinion on it, is patent-free seeds so that we are free to save the seeds and, and move that forward. So um, there's a whole lot of conversation around um, free, um, saving seed and uh, free seed, right? So I, I think maybe we, at some point we need to separate the conversation around the cost of seed and the value of genes, right? It's really important for African farmers, like farmers in the rest of the world, to have access to yield-improving genes, right? Mm -hmm. That does not mean patent-free. That does not mean free stuff. But neither does it have to cost, if, we can, if my country can afford it, if countries can afford it, that would be great, right? There's a lot of public good. There's uh, universal health care. If we can afford universal seed <laughs> availability that gives the right genes to farmers. I think for me what is, goes, has to be to put to question is, should African farmers, or any other farmers for that matter, not have the right level of genes just because they don't, they, they don't pay for them? Is that what you're looking for? Shouldn't you be given a choice as to what you should pay for or what you should use if you can afford it? Mm -hmm. So here, like the work we do at Agra is ensuring that farmers have a choice. If you want to buy a variety that yields five tons, you should have access to a variety that yields five tons. If you want to save seed, you should be able to save seed. The question is, what are you trying to achieve in your life? What would be wrong is to create a poverty trap for African farmers by calling it farmer saved seed and ensure that they never have access to the right genes to improve their lives. That would be wrong. So, so there's a question just for information, I think, about what proportion of the carbon emissions in agriculture comes from the production of power that we need to, for water? That comes from what? From, from the power we need to provide water, so I presume the irrigation systems. I'm not an expert in irrigation, mm. but I'm told it's a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm sure there are experts here who know. But uh, I know that uh, emissions from rice schemes have been quantified and, and they are known. I mean, there are all sorts of efforts also to bring those emissions down. Mm -hmm. So the good, good news is that all, many of these things, there's a lot of efforts and a lot of innovations that are being put in place to contain some of these challenges. So I, I think what would, what would be really a, a big problem is if we didn't know that this is a challenge and if we didn't have a mechanism of dealing with that challenge. But I think there are quite a number of um, food system related emissions that are now being addressed because people understand them. So I've been asked to make sure I take questions from the room, but I couldn't see anyone with their hand up. Please do feel that this is your moment. Oh, fantastic. Could they do that? Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, this uh, exciting presentation. I'm Rocio Diaz Chavez from the Center for Environmental Policy. And the last four and a half years, thank you very much. The last four and a half years, I was uh, actually living in Kenya and working in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. But I've been working for uh, over 15 years also in Africa. And uh, there are so many things that are related to this, uh, this topic that you introduce us to. But um, I think that also uh, there is something that is really important for the case of particularly sub-Saharan Africa, because we tend to think of Africa as a country. There are f more than 50 countries with different characteristics, each one of them. But uh, majority of them are moving into uh, high, um, more amount of people moving into middle class, uh, the young people are, are looking for other activities that are not most of the time related to, to the rural environment. So how to try to keep these youth into continuing working in, in the rural environment, uh, but improving their conditions as well, because this is something that they also have aspirations, and this is something that is not most of the time linked into the agricultural systems with a more kind of modern opportunities for this youth? So um, 
first of all, I don't think we should keep youth in rural villages, rural areas, just for the sake of keeping them there, right? We should ensure that there are the right services for them and the right, um, yeah, the right services to meet their aspirations. That, you know, the things they want to, to be part of can be available to them in those areas. So basically, those areas too should be developed to be able to accommodate uh, youth. It, from an agricultural perspective, it would be really, really good to find ways to incorporate in the youth in the agricultural sector because they are the most innovative, they have great ideas, many of them are learned or have had an opportunity to acquire some form of education. So what we are doing in my, in my institution, actually, we've just introduced a program to interest youth in the agriculture sector. Uh, but to, to do that, we really can't think about agriculture as how you produce food. We need to think about, about agriculture from a food system perspective. And since this whole food system perspective started, we see more opportunities for young people to engage in, in um, value addition, to engage in trade. We have a platform of about 2,000 women that are women SMEs in the agriculture sector alone. And we want to do, we want in the next five years to create 1.5 million, you know, good jobs, not just any job, 1.5 million jobs for young people, especially young women in the agriculture sector. Because for us, the incentive is, this is, you need to drop this energy into the sector for the sector to grow and be able to provide more opportunities. So the, the, the interest would be really to see how we create opportunities within production systems themselves from the service perspective, but also away from production, ensuring that the whole value chain, the whole food value chain is working all the way to the consumer for young people so that they can be able to participate. Thank you, Agnes. So we'll take one more question from the room. And I've got one more question online. So I don't know, there's a gentleman here, if you could bring, while, while you're bringing the microphone down, I, I'll just read something, because I know this is a huge subject and it's hugely controversial, but somebody online has talked to us about the, the concentration of corporate power distorting food system transitions and how, how the interplay between the politics of that it sort of is, is uh, what are your thoughts on that, Agnes? <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether that's a question for me coming from Africa or whether that's a question for you all that live here. In Africa, I don't know corporate power concentration. I know smallholder concentration. But um, I, I guess what I saw in the food systems conversation that becomes important is the fact that, at least in the West, 90% of the food system sits within corporate businesses, right? And you want them to do the right thing. And we managed to bring them around the table uh, to ensure that um, they listen to the concerns of everyone of us. I talked about how much food is being wasted here. That food is being wasted because the retail system has set standards that don't even speak to what the, the consumer doesn't even know the type of choices that are being made for them, mm -hmm. right? So, so, there are a number of things that have to be fixed within that environment. It's not going to be fixed overnight. But what can be fixed in the immediate term is find ways of building trust among all of us so that when they say in the corporate sector, when they say they are doing the right thing from a food perspective, it's actually the right thing. It's not to get away, you know. It's fixing, if it is fixing food types so that we have the right diets on, on the shelf, that they are doing it, they are not doing it too just earn points, you know. So there's a whole lot that needs to be done, but what we learned from the food system perspective, there's a lot of mistrust mm. for when companies say we'll do this, that they actually don't come through. There's a whole lot that has, uh, was shown that they don't come through, but also companies saw that the mistrust is huge and they're willing to do something about it. So I guess for the most important part of this is we need to keep co pushing for this conversation and we need to understand the value of us individuals as consumers. That was probably the biggest part of the food system. I mean, that we, we, we are not powerless. We actually have the ability to understand what comes to our houses, what comes to our tables, and can influence how that reduces 
the, the, how it reduces waste in the system, how that forces good behavior. So there, there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen around that. It's not going to change overnight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, thank you, Agnes. Great to hear you. I think there was a slide, there was a slide, I won't try and find it now, but there was a slide back there which focused very much on three things, two of which I can remember. One was on seeds and new varieties of various kinds which we know will produce much greater yields. Secondly, with new fertilizers, new targeted fertilizers, you put those two things together. There's a third thing, and I can't remember what the third thing is, but there's three interventions there. Seed, fertilizers, and what was the third one? Ex extension? No. Mm -hmm. hmm? Soils. Oh, yeah, soils, yeah. Yes, hmm. and soils. But those three things, if you get them right, you really do change production. I mean, I've seen it in many places in Africa over time. You can put those things together and you do make a big difference. And so I, I would like to sort of say there is a ground for optimism here. Even if we're all sitting here being very depressed. <laughs> No, no, no. That, the idea was not to get anybody depressed. The idea was to get everybody excited about speaking up against, speaking up for staying within 1.5 degrees. I thought I got you excited, just letting you know that, <laughs> just, <laughs> just letting you know that you know if we give, we, we, if we get seeds, and I showed you a whole complexity of seeds out there, seeds and fertilizers. And we did something about our soil. All these are things that are within our control, even as Africa, uh, even as African farmers, that are within our control now to get to do. We are not helpless, right? We are not helpless. I'm just saying is we cannot manage if we go beyond 1.5. Under the current situations, if we stay like this, this thing can be fixed, right? So I was trying to paint a picture of optimism but again, coming from only if we stay within 1.5 degrees. So that, that's where the anxiety comes in from where I'm sitting. If we don't stay within 1.5, we are in real trouble. If we stay within 1.5, we can fix this with seeds, with fertilizers, and with soil carbon, which we are already doing. This is stuff that we just need to do at scale. Yeah. Thank you so much, Agnes. I like to end on a very positive, optimistic note, and I'd just like to say what a privilege and a pleasure it is to meet you and hear your amazing, inspiring summary of the world. I come to this as a clinician who's done work on health and public health. I knew nothing about this, and it's absolutely fascinating and really, really inspiring, so thank you. And I'd like to warmly thank you all, those who've joined us online and who are also here in the room, for making time in your evenings to come and join it with us. So we're very pleased to um, invite you all to take drinks, in the, I think, in the ground floor where you came in. And I'd like to thank David as well for leading our debate and um, for introducing Agnes. And, of course, to Agnes for your time thank and you. to come to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay.